the thread series. It really reminded me that uh, Jesus is coming and to establish his kingdom. And uh, from the beginning to the end, uh, the Bible is a unified story that points to Christ. I have really enjoyed this thread sermon series. Um, one of my favorite things that Pastor Stan said is that faith is what you're running towards and not what you're running from. And that has really stuck with me. I love uh, this message that Pastor Stan gave us to see Jesus from the beginning to the end and how the promises have been fulfilled. This sermon series of The Thread has been incredible, specifically the week that Pastor Stan prayed over the women of the church and talked about the women in the Bible who made a big impact. Really the thread that was in the words and how it was read because it points to Jesus Christ uh, in the uh, New Testament and I love Old Testament covenant and how you see blood throughout and then it leads you to the cross of Jesus. So. Um, the thread just stood out to me, and that's why I loved it all. It has just been so amazing to see how God has been speaking to us and telling us about Jesus from the very beginning, from creation, all the way through the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the way to the book of Revelation. And, you know, I've learned so many different aspects of, of how God had woven that message into every step along the way. And now we get to look forward to Jesus is coming back and, and taking us home with him. So excited for that. Good morning. Glad to have you with us for the finale of The Thread. We started the week after Easter, and our goal was to give you a way to summarize the theme of Scripture. So we have a Bible at the beginning, a Bible at the end. Right about here is the cross of Christ, the New Testament. And uh, I will make a confession to you that personally... I've been studying this book for more than half a century. I love this book. Uh, I believe there's nothing in this that's not good for you as a person because God's the one who wrote it. He's the author of it. There are actually 40 authors uh, that were used to write 66 books that span a few thousand years uh, recording events that happened in the Middle East, in Europe, and in Africa uh, before and during the time of Christ, written in three different languages. I'll also confess to you that while I have a couple of uh, graduate degrees dealing with this book, I will never fully understand it until the day I die. There are still mysteries in there, things that I read. I go, okay, what is that and why is that? And yet it's an amazing book. And so uh, we're going to do a, a flyby, uh, buckle in, based on what people said last service, like, wow, I can't believe you got through all that. So hopefully I do again. Uh, it is going to be akin to drinking from a fire hose, all right? But before I do first things first, O-H. Okay, total setup, thank you, okay? Because none of you go, oh, no, you, eh, right. if I'd have had you stand, you'd have done O-H-I-O. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to stand and do some hand motions, all right? So everybody get up, all right? Come on, you fell for it, let's go. Um, if you're new, just go along with it because we want you to remember Scripture, and you can go back to this now, it'll be on our website. Uh, and so when you, when you talk about it, interact with it, take notes, it helps. But when you act it out, it really helps cement in your memory, okay? So I'll do the motion and the description. Not going to do the details, I'll do that when I preach. Uh, and then you echo afterwards, okay? So you watch, listen, and then go ahead and do it. So creation gets flooded. The chosen family goes to the promised land. Conquer and settle. We three kings. Divided we fall. Shape up or ship out. Poetry and wisdom. Return. Take some coordination to that one. You did very well. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. The Holy Spirit is given. Pay attention. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. See all the people. Go. <laughs> Close enough. We're getting on a curve. Letters to churches. All hell breaks loose. Paradise restored. Straight arms like a V. Victory. Okay? Great. Give yourself a hand. Good job. Go ahead and have a seat. That is the Bible in uh, 60 seconds. So let's back up and let me talk you through that. Uh, this is mostly repetitious, but it helps us to land on an understanding. First of all, when we talk about creation gets flooded, the Bible begins with 
10 supernatural miraculous words. And the first four words of the Bible are its presupposition. In the beginning, God. The Bible doesn't try to prove the existence of God. It assumes it. In fact, in Psalms, the poet, the poet said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Paul, later in the New Testament, uh, in the book of Romans, says even from creation, what God has made, you could see his immutable attributes, uh, the character of the artist in his art. And boy, that, that opening video just moves me to tears with the greatness of God. And so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You say, do I believe that? Yeah, I believe that. It's a spectacular statement. It is, but it's a supernatural book about a supernatural God. I would not worship a God I could fully figure out and understand and comprehend because he'd be too small. And so this is an invitation to say yes to a book uh, that calls us to a life of faith. It says he made us in his image, male and female created he them. So just side note for our culture, our gender is something that God pre-designed and decided yet in our womb, our mother's womb. It's not for us to decide. And then Satan enters the scene. Although mankind, Adam and Eve, were placed in the Garden of Eden, it was paradise, perfect harmony with them and God, with themselves, with each other, and with their environment. Satan starts to tempt Eve and says, did God really say? And convinces her that what God said wasn't that important to follow. You could go ahead and do what you want to. That is the essence of sin. And so sin enters through Eve. She shares that with Adam. He does the same. And what we learn about sin then has been true ever since and is true about sin now. Sin takes you farther than you wanted to go, makes you stay longer than you wanted to stay, and makes you pay more than you wanted to pay. Can I hear an amen from every sinner who's learned that? All right? And when you talk about sin making you pay more than you want to pay, the Apostle Paul references this first sin that theologians call the fall of man in Romans chapter 5. He says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. The Bible says all of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God. That creates a huge crisis for all of us because the Bible says the wages, the payment for that sin is death. So death, disease, suffering, heartache, injustice, insecurity, fear, anxiety, all that is the result of that spiritual fall of man through sin. But we have said that there is one theme for every book of Scripture. Would you repeat after me? Look forward to Jesus. Every book of the Bible points to Christ. His first coming at Christmas when he was born in a manger and also to what is called his second coming. I'll talk about that in just a few moments. Genesis, the first two chapters are creation, and then you have chapter 3 is their mankind's fall, and in Genesis chapter 3 is the first look forward to Jesus moment. And uh, it says in Genesis 3 that when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a curse that they lived under from then on. It's the curse of sin. You and I live under that. Uh, to this day, it includes death and suffering. And God says in Genesis 3, as he's describing the curse to Adam and then to Eve and then to the serpent, which represents Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Think ancestor.com. That's very important. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, if you had a choice, would you like to take a, a baseball bat to your heel or a baseball bat to your head? How many of you would vote for the heel, obviously, okay? Because a blow to the head can be fatal. And so what God is saying here, even in Genesis chapter 3, it's look forward to Jesus because through the seed of a woman, through, through the ancestry of humanity, there's going to come one who will deal Satan a death blow to the head, all right? And we're going to see that that happens at the end of Scripture and evil is done. And if you go to the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson has a subtle way of reminding us of Genesis 3.15 because in the opening scene, Christ is walking in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see a snake slither across the path and a a sandaled shoe does this to the snake's head, symbolizing he will bruise you head, he will, your head, he will put you to death, he will do away with evil. Jesus Christ is going to do away with evil, and the Bible starts by saying, look forward to Jesus, that's who this is all about. And so with that, mankind continues their fall, unfortunately, and by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, the world is filled with violence. God regrets having made mankind. 
He finds one righteous man named Noah and his family. He decides to do a do-over, floods the world with a worldwide flood, but Noah is a righteous man, obeys God, a key to his righteousness, and he builds an ark. doesn't know what an ark is before he's told to do it. You can read about that in the early chapters of Genesis. He has three sons that become the, the genetic, biological forefathers of the human race, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham migrates to, the, to Africa, Shem across the Middle East, and Japheth up into the areas of Europe. Now, when we talk about the chosen family makes their way to the promised land, you get to Genesis chapter 12, and we meet a man named Abram and his wife Sarai. They ch- their names change from that to Abraham and Sarah, symbolic of the fact that when you follow God, when you, he becomes the focal point of your life and you go where he wants you to go, it is supposed to change you. If you say, oh, I've been a Christian for 30 years, I'm the same person, then you've missed something. Because following God is meant to be a transformational process. And he makes a promise to Abraham, and there are three dimensions to it. I'm going to make you a great nation, I'm going to give you a great land, and through your descendants, all the people of the earth will be blessed. And God, say God keeps his promises. He was 75 when this promise came. His wife, 65. They battled infertility, gave up on having kids. But sure enough, God made them. He is the genetic forefather of the nation of Israel. He makes them a great nation. He gives them the nation of Israel, the promised land, roughly the the area that they have today. And through his descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. If you go to the family tree of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, where it says in the King James, and so and so beget so and so, this one beget this one, this one beget this one, that family tree, you go back to the beginning family tree of Jesus, and his ancestry.com is Abraham. Would you say God keeps his promises? Thousands of years later. Now, Abraham says, yes, we're going to follow God. And so God says, great, let's go to this land I have promised for you, this promised land. They get to the promised land. Remember what's happening in the promised land? There's a famine in the land. Oh, gee, thanks, God. Love this promise. All right. Would you say there are problems with the promise? That wasn't very confident. Say it. Tell your neighbor that. Come on, let them know. If anybody tries to sell you the spiritual bill of goods, if you accept Jesus, you follow Christ, everything is always going great. They're lying to you from the beginning of Scripture because Abraham said yes to follow God, and we found that with the promised land, there's a famine, there are problems. And the Bible says that it gives us the reason why. The backstory: God tested Abraham. Testing, one, two, testing, right? He tested him to see if he would still trust him. So you're living out a promise. Some of you made a promise how many years ago, stood before somebody and said, till death do us part, I do, and you promised that. And have you noticed there's problems with that promise? A dozen honest people, okay. <laughs> Boy, God, you're living out the promise of, oh, well, I always want to have a child, and now you have a child, and there are problems with that promise. Prayed for a new job, oh, I want to get a new job. There are problems with that promise. There are problems with the promise. Trust God with the promise anyway. As we follow God, there are other challenges. There are times God calls you to surrender your dream. You know, Abraham, they finally had that baby. He's like 100 years old. She's 90. They have little Isaac. His name means laughter. God has a sense of humor. And he's about kindergarten age, and God says to Abraham, hey, Abraham, you know that boy Isaac? Yeah, God, boy, you, you, you're so faithful. 25 years later, you fulfill your promise. 25 years, by the way, tell your neighbor, God's not in a hurry. He does not live by your time. And some of us judge God and determine he's not faithful, he's not answering, where is God? Because he didn't meet our deadline. I don't know who that's for, but some of you just wait and trust God. He's not in a hurry. So that little boy Isaac, oh, God, he is so amazing. Boy, when you do a promise, you're well, God says, by the way, I want him back. What? Yeah, I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. Now, that sounds preposterous to us. It wasn't quite so much so to Abraham because in his day, the pagan religions surrounding him, child sacrifice was part of what they did. Okay, God. Abraham goes up the mountain with his son Isaac, and just before he sacrifices him, God says, okay, time out. I was just testing you. Say he tested him. I'm testing you, but you passed the test. I will never ask you or anyone to sacrifice their child. One son will be sacrificed, and it'll be mine. There's a ram in the thicket. Go get the ram and sacrifice that ram. But he tested Abraham. And guess what? If he tested Abraham, guess who else he's going to test? You. 
And he said, Abraham, I gave you that dream. Will you give it back or is it now yours? God calls us to hold our dreams and our blessings loosely, knowing that he is the one who gave that to us. And then he went through all kinds of tests, Abraham and Isaac, on family struggles. But you don't have any family or marriage struggles. We'll just skip right over that. (laughs) No, there's a lot of, there's a boatload there. Sibling rivalry, all kinds of conflict and dysfunction. You can read about it. And so Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob and Esau, wow, sibling rivalry at a whole new level. But Jacob has 12 sons, and they become the head of the 12, say, tribes, tribes of Israel. And among those 12 sons is Joseph. Joseph is dad's favorite. His brothers hate him for it. Talked about it last weekend. But Joseph shows us that, you know, you, God's will also includes some hard places. They sold him into slavery. He ends up unjustly in prison. And some of you are at a place right now in life, you didn't deserve it. They did it to you. Things happened out of your control. And you're in a mess of a place and it is no fault of your own. Don't do this. Don't question God. Trust him. Because we find from Joseph that sometimes God's will, God's path, leads you through very painful places that you didn't even deserve. He ends up in prison more than once. But Joseph, and he's probably my favorite New Old Testament hero because he never strayed, never failed, and then got back. No, he stayed faithful to God, and he went from the prison to the palace. And he becomes the number two guy in the Egyptian empire because the king has a dream and and God gives Joseph the interpretation of it, how to spare the Egyptian empire from a worldwide famine. And he does that and and the king says, hey, your father, you know, he's in Israel. Why don't you have them come move to Egypt? There's plenty of food and I'll take care of them. So that's how the people of Israel came to Egypt. Again, there were less, less than 100 people at that time. And so then they begin to multiply And then the Pharaoh died. There arose a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, the Bible says. And the the Jews are are multiplying like crazy and they're prospering. And the the king says, hey, wait a minute, time out. These Jews are going to take over. We've got to do something. Let's make them our slaves. So the nation of Israel becomes slaves to Egypt. And they live like that for four centuries. And they're crying out to God for deliverance. Finally, God hears their prayer and raises up a guy named Moses. And he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. He does a huge risk of his own life. He was a fugitive at the time. And he goes to Pharaoh and he says, God has a message for you. Let my people go. Pharaoh's response, (laughs) yeah, right. You gotta be kidding me. Get out of here. So God strikes the Egyptians with 10 plagues, supernatural plagues. You can read the story in the book of Exodus. And so finally, God lets the people go. And this nation of about 1.5 to 2 million people now, they migrate out of Egypt. They're heading for Israel. And they go through the wilderness. And weeks out of their journey, they come to the wilderness of Paran. And God says to Moses, I want you to, to take 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, named after the 12 sons of Jacob, okay, pop quiz, right? right. And so check out the land I'm going to give you. So these 12 spies go into the land of Israel, and they check it out, and they come back after 40 days. It is incredible. It's amazing. It's flowing with milk and honey and the fruit and the bounty. And yeah, all 12, yes. But 10 of the 12 go, time out. We can't have it. There's like giants in the land. We feel like grasshoppers. And they've got fortified cities with huge walls, and they've got all these armies and these weapons, and we're just a bunch of former slaves wandering through the wilderness. We can't have them. We're going to die in the wilderness. And the whole nation starts to cry and moan. And Joshua and Caleb, the two positive spies, go, no, 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 no. Time out, time out. Stop. No, we can have it. God didn't say, go spy it out if I give it to you. God said, spy it out because I've given it to you. And they're going, no, we're going to die in the wilderness. And so there's a huge lesson learned in the wilderness. And the journeys that you're going on in life as you follow God, don't miss the lessons. Tell your neighbor, don't miss the lessons. Or say it to yourself. Some of us are living on cruise control, and we're just flying by lessons God's trying to give for us. One of the lessons here is the power of pessimism. Because those 10 spies who gave out the bad report had the whole nation moaning, we're going to die in the wilderness. We're gonna, we should have stayed in Egypt. We never should have. We're going to die in the wilderness. So you know what God said? Oh, kids, I know you're kind of shook right now. We're going to be. No, God says, fine. You want to die in the wilderness? Die in the wilderness. That's what they did. About face. Promised land. It was going to be for you. It's not. You want to die in the wilderness? Take 40 years. 
boy, for this whole generation to die off. And that's what happened. And when that whole generation died off, Joshua now is, is getting up there in age, and Joshua now becomes the replacement for Moses, and the new generation of Israelites goes into the promised land. Beware the power of pessimism. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the things you say. And those who love it will eat his fruit. So be careful. It's, it's, that's not the call to, to talking in denial. But boy, as you describe the difficulty, bring the hopeful perspective. So they go into the promised land and then conquer and settle. They are to go in and drive out the inhabitants, all of them, and then settle it into 12 territories like states named after the 12 tribes of Israel. And so again... We get into the promised land, we're going to conquer it, and they have the first lesson coming up is the first city they come to, Jericho. And so they come up to Jericho, and they see this city with huge walls, probably as high as the stadium seats, and they're probably 12 feet thick or so, stone walls, and across, around the top are soldiers who are, who are posting guard. The city is all shut up, the gates are locked, and these Jews come up there and go, hmm, intimidated. They're scared. We're supposed to take that city? How? There's, there's soldiers up there. We're just former slaves. We're just kind of, you know, camping in the wilderness. And, and the slaves learn something, former slaves, on how God works. Because they, they have another spy delegation to go check out the city, and they meet a prostitute named Rahab. By the way, if you think God can't use you, if you think your past is too shameful, then remember that name, Rahab the prostitute, okay? Go fast forward now to the family tree of Jesus in the book of Matthew, and you will find in JesusAncestry.com, guess who is one of his ancestors way, way, way back? Rahab the prostitute. If God can use her, God can use you. So she says to the, the spies, she said, oh, we heard about what your God did in, beyond the river in the wilderness. Our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of your God. All these guys, these, these soldiers you see on the top of this wall, they are scared to death. And if you have a fearful enemy, guess what? That's a defeated enemy. And so God, how cool is this? God says, okay, guys, battle number one, you're going to take down the city of Jericho. You don't have any weapons and catapults or whatever, so let's do this. March around it seven times. Last day, blow your horns, yell, yell, and we'll take it down. And that's what happened. Here's the lesson. The Israelites come up to their Jericho, and they don't know that they're all scared to death. They don't know God's pretty much got the battle all teed up, and it's theirs. How many of you are facing a Jericho kind of situation of opposition in your life? Some kind of pocket of opposition. It might be a marriage, a relationship, family, physical, mental, emotional, financial, career, academic, okay? Here's what God spoke to me years ago, like a smack in the face, a loving one. Stan, I don't feel obligated to send you an email every morning with my plans for the day. I'm God, you're not. And I realized I do not know everything God is doing about anything in my life. Say, I do not know everything God's doing about anything in my life. He already had the battle beaten and they didn't even know it. God is dealing with your life and in your life in ways you do not know, so don't just come to the conclusion, put two plus two together and get ten. Oh, no, no, trust God. They learned that the hard way. Now, when they went into the promised land, God said, I'm not going to drive them out all at once. I want you to drive them out. I'm going to drive the inhabitants out little by little. Say little by little. Because otherwise, if it's all empty at once, you won't be able to settle it well. And he said, I'll drive them out little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. And when it comes to following God, when it comes to becoming who he wants you to be, guess what? You're going to become who God wants you to be. Say it, little by little. You know how you're going to be more patient? Little by little. That's going to happen. He's going to test you. You can probably name some of the people that have tested your patience, all right, the situations. You know how you're going to be more generous? Little by little. You know how you're going to be more kind? You know how you're going to be more victorious over lust and, and envy? You know how you're going to feel healthier inside as a person? It's a process, little by little. 
Now, God's intention in the book of Judges was he wanted to be their king, and they would be his people. He would have judges who would kind of be the supreme court of the land and legislate things. And the first judge we meet is a guy named Gideon. And again, if you're just reading this, you're going to miss it, the lessons that are there. He says to Gideon, Gideon is hiding from the Amalekites. That's the enemy of the day. And he's threshing wheat in a wine press. So he's a coward down in this wine press threshing wheat, which you don't normally do. Scared to death. An angel appears to him, and I'm sure he's startled, like, oh, is this the enemy going to kill me? And the angel says to him, listen to what the angel says, the Lord is with you, you coward. No. He says, the Lord is with you, you valiant warrior. Say valiant warrior. warrior. Gideon had to say, who, me? Who are you talking about? I'm not a valiant warrior. I'm scared to death. You see, God sees you as you can become. God sees you who you're in the process of being if you stay faithful and follow him. And you stay in his hands, and he does his work in you. I am confident, here's how Paul says it, I am confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will continue to bring it to perfection until the day of Christ Jesus, you valiant warrior, even though now that doesn't feel that way. So if there were a negative label about you highlighting one of your deficiencies... Maybe your dad said it all the time, or your mom, or your spouse, or your kids, or your boss, or a teacher, or whatever. What would be the opposite of that? And then picture an encounter with an angel of God saying, hey, and they call you the opposite. You know, like maybe you battle insecurity and anxiety all the time. Just nervous wreck. And the angel says to you, hey, calm, peaceful, confident one. Yeah, you not me. Yeah, it is you. If you trust me, little by little, we're going to drive those other things out, and that's who you're going to become. Amazing lesson that we learn. Unfortunately, there was a failure of faith. The people, the generation before, did not pass their faith on to, their, to the generation after them. And Judges closes. It was a roller coaster. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin's a disgrace to any people. And when there was a righteous judge, the nation would flourish. They'd get blessed. They'd get distracted their blessings. They'd forget. They'd fall again. Roller coaster. And the last verse of the book of Judges is this tragic ending. In those days... There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Recipe for disaster then for society, and when everyone does what is right in their own eyes, the United States of America is a recipe for disaster now. So the people, we have we three kings, and the three kings in the golden age of Israel were Saul, David, and Solomon. And the people of Israel cried out to the final king, a final judge, uh, Samuel. And they said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, Now appoint a king for us to judge us, catch this next phrase, like all the nations, just like everybody else. Just like everybody else is a horrible standard by which to live. Just like everybody else is another recipe for disaster. And what we see in the nation of Israel and what was their demise is what we see happening currently in our own culture. And that is a phrase we coined a long time ago called culture creep. Culture just creeps in and overcomes the righteous intentions of God for his people. Sociologists today, secular sociologists who study, and, and, and Christian who study the church and, and non church people, have found there is a negligible difference in the values, lifestyles, choices, habits, attitudes of believers and non believers. Culture has crept in. And it was, a, it was a recipe for disaster. Saul was impatient, untrusting, disobedient, and a failure. David was a man for God's own heart, and even though he had some failure in his life, he tried to stay faithful to God and repentant. And David is probably best known for his famous battle, David and Goliath. Okay, you've heard that, a giant. David says something to Goliath that reminds me of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, when David went out there, he's a shepherd boy, he's probably 14, 13 years old, and there's this giant six inches shorter than the basketball goal, nine and a half feet tall. And, and Paul says something that I'm sure uh, was a rework of David in Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that's basically what David said, man, I'm going to tear you apart because God is for me. You are no match. Question, the Jerichos, the Goliaths in your life, what do you say to them? 
What do you say to the, well, I didn't have that growing up? What do you say to the competition and the attitudes in your workplace? What do you say to the marriage issues that won't go away? What do you say to the health concerns? What do you say to the academic process or the lack of it? What do you say to the giants in your life? The same thing you should say to the Jerichos in your life. You know what? With God, you're going to go down. You are no match for God, and if God is for me, who can be against me? It is hugely significant what you say. Power of your words. Solomon, the third king, David's son, started out incredible uh, and was the wisest man on the planet, wrote a good chunk of the Old Testament. He did not finish well. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, centuries before Solomon was chosen king, God warned the people through Moses, and he said, when you have a king, be careful, because they will have a tendency to multiply horses, become huge arms traders, have an alliance with Egypt. You know the place I freed you from? That place. They will multiply wives and multiply riches and become distracted and make it all about themselves. And before it was over, it was like Solomon took that and said, that's what I'm going to do. He did every one of those in spades. And by the time he died, was a distracted and d destructive king, and, and he ends up writing the book of Ecclesiastes, disillusioned with life. And the people once again realize an earthly king is not our solution, and so there is that hunger for the king of kings. Look forward to Jesus. On Mother's Day, we took a brief break, and we looked at Esther, uh, who was a Jewish exile living in the kingdom of Persia, trying to keep her nationality a secret, especially when a genocide erupted to do away and, with and kill all the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. But her uncle Mordecai, she ends up being queen of Persia. It's a cra crazy story. It's amazing. Go back and watch Mother's Day. And her uncle Mordecai says, you've got to speak up. You've got to risk everything you have. You have to speak out on behalf of the Jewish people. And he says, who knows that you weren't raised up by God for such a time as this. What all the ladies say for such a time as this. Because likewise, God has you in your life, in your relationships, in the places of your life for such a time as this. Don't forget that. Live beyond your history. Live beyond your current insecurity. Because Esther shows us how she did that and the great things that God did because of that. And then we said, divided we fall. The northern kingdom of Israel, because when they split... Uh, after those three kings, um, John, Solomon's son was foolish. The people said, we're not staying with you. They split into the northern and southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was the one tribe of Judah. The other 11 tribes went north to, to Israel. So when you read Israel and Judah, that's not the same. That's like Canada, United States, all right, in, in the book of Kings and Chronicles. And so they are divided, and the northern kingdom fell in 722 B.C. Uh, that's because there were no righteous kings. They just went... Judah lasted about 150 years longer because righteousness exalts a nation. Sin's a disgrace to any people. They have a righteous king. It would kind of up their longevity, and then they'd fall up their longevity, so they, they lasted longer. And so when you look at that, look at the culture creep that comes in. Manasseh is probably the best bad example of the kings uh, that didn't follow God. It says, and Manasseh did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. What did Manasseh do? Well, among other things, Manasseh actually worshipped the god Molech and who was one of the pagan gods of the people that they were supposed to drive out. And part of Molech worship was literally child sacrifice, burning your infant baby boy on a, on a, on a pagan altar. And he did that. Hideous. And so, talk about evil. Talk about perversion. And so, surely, under his reign, there was no righteousness. He did not exalt the nation. The nation plummeted. His son Ammon didn't rule very long. He followed him. But then his grandson Josiah brings a whole lot of hope because none of us can think of an evil as bad as what Manasseh did, but many of us here can look back a generation or two and we see evil in our family tree, dysfunction, sin, and uh, there is a, a looming shadow we can be fearful of. It takes the form of a saying, like, Father, you've heard that. You see how things pass from generation to generation to generation, and they were an alcoholic, and they're an alcoholic, and they were, they were abusive, and they had a temper, or, or they whatever, and it just passes down. And it, that is not something that you are destined and damned to if you have bad stuff in your ancestry.com. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us that, and Josiah is a perfect example of that. His grandfather was Manasseh. 
My grandfather was a violent alcoholic. My dad had to wrestle a gun on my grandfather's hand because my grandfather was about to shoot his father. So that's myfamilyancestry.com. Manasseh, Josiah had Manasseh. His dad wasn't much better. And then you read about Josiah, and Josiah did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of his forefather David, nor did he turn to the right or to the left. And Josiah was that shock absorber generation. I'm going to absorb that. I'm not going to take that evil and pass it along to my children. I am going to serve the Lord as for me and my house. It was possible then. It is possible now. Be the shock absorber generation. Unfortunately, though, as things went, Israel and Judah both plummeted. And we read in 2 Kings 25, Judah was led away into exile as Israel was from its land to Babylon. And the exiled people of God looked forward to a Savior, a Deliverer, a Messiah. They looked forward to Jesus. Now, during the time of these kings, there were prophets who said, shape up or ship out. That was their message. Over and over and over again. The people didn't heed it, at least not for very long. One of those prophets that I'll look at was Isaiah. Chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Come now. This is God talking. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they'll be like wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat of the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Come, let, let, let's reason together. It's like God talking to us now. Let, let's just reason together. You're a sinner, right? You have sin. You have sin, but if you repent of it, it even though it's like scarlet, I can make it white as snow. I can forgive you. But you need, a, you need a deliverer. You need a redeemer. You need a savior. God tried to reason with the people then, tries to reason with us now. Most of us in this room, when the Holy Spirit has said, let's reason together, let's realize you've got sin in your life, you need a Savior, most of us have already said yes to that Savior. And that was the promise and the, and the confrontation and the offer that Isaiah made. Talk about look forward to Jesus. You don't need to read the Gospels to know about Jesus. Isaiah is the one who tells us seven centuries before Christ was born, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call him Emmanuel, seven centuries before. Likewise, it says in chapter 9, the child will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And it's as though Isaiah has a front row seat to the crucifixion of Christ in chapter 53 when he says he was wounded for our transgressions and he goes through and describes the suffering of Christ in great detail all along declaring the message of the prophets, shape up or ship out and look forward to Jesus. We took a break from the relent, unrelenting message of the prophets, talked about poetry and wisdom. When it comes to poetry, we looked at the, the love songs, like the Song of Solomon. In fact, Friday night, uh, the marriage builders did a great job with uh, the Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. And Friday night, we studied the Song of Solomon in detail and discovered how to have a better sex life. You missed it. It's good. There was daily wisdom in the book of Proverbs, like chapter 3, verse 5. My dad's favorite verse, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Don't lean on your understanding. That's hard to do. How many of you are thinker-figure-outers like me? Man, I think and figure out, think and figure out, think and figure out, and think and think and think and think and think and think. And, think, and, think. and what gets really hard, when I can't think enough and figure it out. Or when I try to figure out what God's doing. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of times I can't figure that out. I can't figure God out. And so what's really hard for me is, well, trust in the Lord with all your heart, not your understanding. Take a leap of faith. And I, I learned a long time ago that God is way more interested in me trusting him than he is in me figuring him out. Because how can I possibly figure out a God of the universe who is infinite? And then we look at the Psalms, their poems and prayers, primarily by David. Psalm 119 tells me what I've come to know about this book, and that is that your word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. It is the guideline for living. And even Psalm 22 says, look forward to Jesus. Jesus quoted it on the cross where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we talked about the return. Shh, 
What's that about? Well, God did call him out of exile. Ezra came back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple in the spiritual ways. Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. And, and Malachi confronts the people kind of obstinate one more time, talks about the terrible day of the Lord, talking about the second coming of Christ. And then shh, for four centuries, there's not another word of God, no books of the Bible. For 400 years, it's silent. And then all of a sudden, joy to the world, the Lord is come. What's that about? It's a picture pouring it out. Paul says in Philippians that Christ emptied himself of his divine rights and privileges in heaven. We will never understand how much love that expressed till we get to heaven and realize it. And he became a human being. There are four biographies of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they are called the Gospels, which means good news. There's lots to learn in those Gospels. One of the things to learn, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 7, you must be born again. Say that. You must be born again. If you're not born again, you will spend eternity in hell. And if you're not ready for that, when you leave today, go by the VIP room, tell them, I had to pray to accept Christ. I want to be born again. They'll help you with that. Another thing in the Gospels is be like Jesus. Say, be like Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, the Son of Man, talking about himself, did not come to be served, but to serve. Live a servant's life. We hear about servant leadership, live that. In your home, in your workplace, in your school, in your community, in your church, be a servant leader and live like Jesus. And then in John 14, we've been talking about this theme all along, look forward to Jesus. At the Last Supper, Jesus re-ups the whole idea of look forward to Jesus. He says to them in John 14, for I go, guys, to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself. There where I am, there you may be also. So for all these centuries from Genesis, we're looking forward to Jesus, and then away in a manger, boom, he comes. Yay, he, all right? But then Jesus said, okay, guys, that's not it. We're not done yet. I'm preparing a place for you, and I'm coming back. So now, since then, we're looking forward to Jesus again, his second coming. So the Holy Spirit is given, all right? He comes down, and the birth of the church, here's the church, here's the steeple, over the door, see all the people, all right? And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says to his disciples, you go, go to Jerusalem, wait, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive, say the word power. Power. Well, that was a real powerful power. Say it again. Yeah. That's better, all right? You'll receive power to be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, that's where you live and do life. In Judea, that's multiplying the church across the region. In Samaria, that's cross-cultural. And in the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the, the foundation of our God-sized vision. And, 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 I, and I'll be with you until the end of the age, he says. And then the Bible says that he has started to ascend into heaven. And the disciples are staring up at him, kind of like when I was a kid, and you let go of a helium balloon. You watch it go, you watch it go. Yeah, I, I still see it. Yeah, yeah. And while they're staring, all of a sudden they hear this, these guys go, what are you looking at? And there's an angel. And, and, and they said, this same Jesus that you are watching will return in like fashion. He's coming back. Look forward to Jesus. Hold that thought. So the church is born, and Jesus made a promise, I will be with you till the coming of the age. So again, look forward to Jesus. So there's letters to churches written by Paul and Peter and John and James and the author of Hebrews. And, and, and there's themes throughout there. One of the things that Paul talks about, that the letters talk about, is be transformed. And he says, don't be conformed to this world, culture creep. Be transformed, how? Not by behave right, but no, it's from the inside out. Be transformed by the renewing of how you think about you, about God, about God's word, about this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and what we say to these things, what we tell ourselves up here will have huge impact on what God does out there. Be transformed. Another thing the letters say is love each other. 1 John 4, 7, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God. It's that powerful. And then a the theme, 1 Thessalonians, I'll come back to it. Look forward to Jesus. There's letters to, to seven more churches in the first three chapters of Revelation. And in the last book of the Bible, all hell breaks loose, chapters 4 through 18. I can't even comprehend or explain the apocalypse that's going to happen as, as the current earth and current human history comes to a close. But then Revelation 21, paradise is restored. It's a victory sign. And John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and he shall wipe away, get this, every tear... There'll no longer be any death. 
There'll be no mourning, no crying, no pain, no curse. And he says, behold, I am making all things new. Yeah, you can applaud that. And so, three times in the last chapter, and what have we said all along? That when the Bible repeats something, it's repeating it for emphasis. So I would think in the very last chapter of the Bible, God's like trying to put everything in there. It needs to be said, the la- this, is the, this is the last chapter. This is it. What does he say three times? Behold, I am coming quickly. If you missed that, behold, I am coming quickly. In this case, it's not clear. Behold, I am coming quickly. You might say, quickly? It's been 2,000, 5,000. No. If he promised here that he's going to send a redeemer, and then what does Paul say? In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Ring a bell? Sounds like what he said in Genesis, that from the seed of a woman will be one who will deal Satan a death blow. If God was faithful to keep that promise from Genesis to Matthew in the fullness of time, away in a manger, then guess what? When Jesus said at the Last Supper, boys, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I'm preparing a place for you, I will come again. Then guess what? Thousands of years later, when Jesus said, I will come again, he is coming again, and he is coming sooner than ever before. And so get this. Paul tells us how he's coming back, and it is absolutely, ridiculously unbelievable, except we started by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is 10 supernatural words to start with. It's a supernatural book about a supernatural God. So when he tells me how he's coming back, you go, do you believe that? Sure. If I believe in the beginning God created, I believe this. Listen to what Paul says as we're looking forward to Jesus. Read this before. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who have already died. So you'll not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Because if you don't have Jesus, you have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if you do say amen. Even so, God will bring with him those who have already died in Christ. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, so far that's us, will not precede those who have already died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And before you can say, what was that? Then we who are alive and remain, we be caught up together with them, say, in the clouds. Sound familiar? They're watching Jesus go up in the book of Acts, and the angel says, this same one that you're watching go up in the clouds, he's going to come back the same way. And what does Paul say in Thessalonians? We're who are alive and remain, be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I got some great comforting news. Jesus promised he's coming back. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back any day. You talk about a reunion we're going to have. I mean, not not just no more curse, no more pain, no more dying, no more grief, insecurity, abuse, whatever. But we're going to have a a phenomenal reunion with all those who have gone before us. And so there is a thread from Genesis to Revelation that is meant to encourage and inspire you, and that is, say it, look forward to Jesus. Say it again. Stand together with me because you say it better standing. All right, stand up. Let's say it again. One more time with passion. Now put your hands together for this finale as we sing about the fact that Jesus is coming back. Have you ever thought that the world has kind of lost its way, yeah, crazy as it seems, yeah, I know it's gonna be okay, it doesn't scare me, it's temporary, there's something better, we got forever, and it won't be long till the moment's on the way, so keep your head up. Coming back, Jesus is coming back. Now don't you give up? 
Nobody knows the day or time No The trumpet's gonna blow And the skies are gonna open wide Oh yeah He's coming for us Just like he told us It's been a long way But there's a new day And we're gonna sing hallelujah When the king arrives Oh you know you gotta keep your head up and Abednego would say, guys, what was it like when you knew that if you didn't bow to that statue that you'd be thrown into a fiery furnace and when the horns blew and millions of people bowed down, you stood tall. What was that like? What was it like when they grabbed you and they threw you in the fiery furnace and you thought you were dead and you said, wait, we're okay. Peter, what was it like when you got out of the boat and you stepped on the water and for like three steps, you were walking on water like Jesus. What was it like when he reached out and he grabbed your hand and he saved you and pulled you out? Moses, what was it like when there was a sea and there was an army and you knew you were dead if God didn't come through and you stretched out your staff and the... the, What was that like? I can't wait to talk with them. So who are four Bible heroes? Let's take it five. That you can't wait to talk to when we get there. Right on the count of three, just say these out loud. One, two, three, go. One. Come on. Did anybody say to the little boy, I want to ask that kid, what was it like when mom packed your lunch for you and you gave it to Jesus, a couple of rolls of bread and a couple of fish, and he fed 20,000? What was that like? Okay, another one, reunion. I want you to think of five loved ones or friends that are already there that you can't wait to see. I got a family, I got friends from here, I've done funerals for... And I can't wait to see them. On the count of three, I want you to say their names out loud. But you can't, you can't wait for the reunion. One, two, three. Go on. Say their names. And then one more. I can't wait for him. He's called the King of Kings. He's called the Lord of Lords. He's the one that gives us hope in the first place. What's his name? He's the one that gives us hope and forgiveness. What's his name? He's the one we'll serve and worship for forever. Shout his name. Give him an ovation of praise because he is worthy. And so he says to you and I, until I come back, I want you to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Wherever it is 
as I've called you to be. I want you to show my love to them because I'm coming back. God bless you. Thanks so much for being here. Have a great week. He's coming back. So keep your head up. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. So don't you give up. No. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. With the world. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back.